Members of the Board of Trustees, administrators, delegates, faculty, and distinguished guests, please be seated. We welcome you to this installation service of the ninth president of Grove City College. Will you join me in prayer? Let us all pray. Lord God, as we gather here today to invest the Honorable Paul J. McNulty with the authority and responsibilities of the office of president of Grove City College, we give you thanks for the biblical heritage and Christian legacy of this great institution. As we convene in this chapel, the outward symbol of your presence on this campus throughout the many years, we invite you, O oh God, to be here in this place and to take part in these inaugural proceedings through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself 
by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
According to the word of God, one of the preeminent expressions of that faith that we've heard so beautifully expressed in song is to call upon the name of the Lord. Thus by faith, let us pray together. O oh God, you who have been the help of Grove City College in ages past, and you who are the hope of this institution for years to come, on this occasion, at the beginning of a new era in the life of this school, it's fitting that we call upon the one who is our ever faithful help. I turn to you now to offer this prayer on behalf of Grove City College, her students, her faculty, its administration and staff. I offer this prayer in good conscience for though I as a minister of the gospel am called to pray principally for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know well that in your providence you have made that church dependent for her good upon other institutions that you have appointed for the preservation and flourishing of people in this age. Thus, in your word, you have appointed the church to pray for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life, dignified in every way. You have taught us that the state is not the church, but neither is the church the state. And though the church needs the profitable labors of the state for her good, she cannot provide for those labors herself, for you have given her a commission to preach the gospel. So, too, we recognize that Grove City College is not the church, but neither is the church an institution of higher learning. And though the church needs the profitable labors of those who establish and sustain such institutions of learning, she cannot provide for those labors herself. Again, you have given her the commission to preach the gospel. And so surely it is fitting by the analogy of faith that a representative of your, of your church pray for institutions of higher learning like Grove City College. For our great God, you have gifted and called and redeemed your people in order that they spend their lives as workers in this world, using their knowledge and skills to do good for themselves and their fellow creatures, all based upon the foundations of your word. What a word a word that teaches us about invisible realities, moral truths about eternal life and death. Without such principled Christians, with a sense of divine vocation and well prepared, with a knowledge of the world and its ways, the culture within which the church must minister is diminished and darkened. And one of the greatest witnesses to the power of the gospel is lost, that of the diligent, informed, self-sacrificing believer, laboring in this world as unto a heavenly master, a living witness of the power of the gospel that the church is called to preach. We know well that such believers cannot be prepared without the help of faithful institutions such as Grove City College, and we know well that such institutions cannot be preserved in this troubled world without your favoring countenance, almighty God of heaven and earth. So in these moments we look, we look to you. I pray, O oh Father, that the faculty and students of this institution would ever be filled with wonder, wonder at who you are, wonder at your creation, wonder as to who they are as creatures created in your image, wonder at your wise government of the whole created order. I pray that this wonder would ever stir a wholesome, energizing curiosity to investigate these things, not proudly to pry, but to use the minds that you have created to explore and discover and to make fruitful the world that you have made. I pray that such investigations would ever be pursued carefully, patiently, and with humility, a readiness to learn from what is real rather than to oppose our, in, upon our investigations self-serving speculation. 
I pray that the well-tested traditions of this college's past ever be communicated to new generations, not as bonds and fetters, but as faithful guideposts to those who share in the same journey as their fathers and mothers. I pray that teaching and learning in every field of investigation would be pursued with an eye toward the good, the true, and the beautiful as they find their source in you, so that students would be well prepared and persuaded of the integration of all things in the living word in whom all things hold together. I pray that as this community grows in understanding, such knowledge would provoke a deep love for the things learned, and that such love would ever lead to a greater love for the one who is their source. I pray that the faculty and students would ever communicate with one another clearly, concisely, and with charity, wholesome purpose in healthy discussions and debate that would bear fruit in this community's growth and skill and advance in understanding. And I pray that this labor would ever be pursued in a collegial fashion, as is befitting a college with the knowledge that our callings are not only individual, but as individuals in a community, in order that, as iron sharpening iron, we would become well-rounded, mutually supportive members of our communities. And I pray that the students of this college would ever go forth into the world and profit from their labors here, that they would be good stewards of that prosperity and that with open hearts and open hands, they would be marked by a generosity to those in need. And I pray that all this labor would ever be pursued with grateful hearts for such a high calling, with willing and bold, thoughtful testimony as to the source. You, O oh, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of this to your good pleasure and glory. I pray these things for the good of this college and her noble mission. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us lift up our voices together in the singing of the college hymn, O God, our help in ages past.
Please be seated. Good morning. My name is Kayla Marish, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Judge Ken Starr. A sixth generation Texan, Judge Ken Starr serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Baylor University, holding the titles of President and Chancellor. He also serves on the faculty of Baylor Law School as the Louise L. Morrison Chair of Constitutional Law. Judge Starr has argued 36 cases before the Supreme Court, including 25 cases during his service as Solicitor General of the United States from 1989 to 1993. He has also served as United States Circuit Judge for the District of Columbia Circuit from 1983 to 1989. He served as law clerk to Chief Justice Warren E. Berger from 1975 to 1977, and as law clerk to Fifth Circuit Judge David W. Dyer from 1973 to 1974. Judge Starr was appointed to serve as independent counsel for five investigations, including Whitewater, from 1994 to 1999. Prior to coming to Baylor, Judge Starr served for six years as the Duane and Kelly Roberts Dean and Professor of Law at Pepperdine. He has also been of counsel to the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, LLP, where he was a partner from 1993 to 2004. Judge Starr previously served as adjunct professor at New York University School of Law and was a distinguished visiting professor at George Mason University School of Law and Chapman Law School. He is admitted to practice in California, the District of Columbia, Virginia, and the United States Supreme Court, and he is the author of more than 25 publications. A member of Columbus Avenue Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, Judge Starr and his wife Alice have three children and six grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Ken Starr. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you. And Kayla, who is a wonderful representative of the student body of Grove City, is off to George Washington Law School. General Barr, she's going to do very well, I think, at your alma mater. What a beautiful chapel. Harbison Chapel, what a lovely vespers we had last evening. What beautiful music and marvelous prayers are lifted up. I was told that I had 10 minutes. I see from this very digital clock, I've already used up 30. <laughs> so that is seconds. Let me then begin by saying, Paul and Brenda, welcome back to your home. And I think it's appropriate, even in the chapel, to say, welcome home, Paul and Brenda. <clears throat> I've been asked to reflect for these few minutes on faith, one of the founding principles and one of the unifying principles of your life together and this community, faith of our fathers, as the great hymn has it. From its beginning in 1876 until this happy day, the inauguration of this good friend and my former colleague, Paul, Grove City has stood as a fierce and determined champion of belief, of faith, and the freedom of the human spirit the Apostle Paul wrote this to the churches in Galatia. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Notice the connection. Faith in Christ and freedom. General Ashcroft will be reflecting on freedom momentarily. At its best, a college or a university is, is a beacon illuminating the darkness or as Dr. Coffin stated just now in that magnificent prayer in this troubled world of ours. A college's very existence is symbolic of a commitment to freedom of the mind, of emancipation from the shackles of ignorance. It embodies the spirit of Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
in a highly secular world, these are very important words. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observant. Please let the record show freedom of faith is not limited to freedom of worship. From the founding of Harvard in 1636, America's story for so long was one of the principles of faith and freedom, serving not only the church, broadly defined, but also by institutions of higher education. In the 18th century, America's founding generation understood this well, regardless of their own belief system as individuals. Here are the words of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, first passed by the Continental Congress under the Articles, and then repassed early on in 1789 by the first Congress sitting in New York, and signed into law by no lesser light than General Washington. The words of the Northwest Ordinance. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. That's still found in the United States Code. Mr. Adams at Harvard, Mr. Madison at Princeton, Colonel Hamilton at Columbia, Virtually all of America's colleges of that era were deeply religious in nature. Everyone knows Harvard's motto, Veritas, but at the founding and for its first two centuries, the motto was actually Veritas Christo et Ecclesia, truth for Christ and the church. Likewise, Yale's original motto Lux et Veritas, light and truth, echoed similar Christian sentiments. Christian higher education, in short, was the order of the day in early America. Indeed, the first public institution of American higher education did not open its doors until quite late in the 18th century. Those founding generations not only left us an enduring framework of government under America's constitution, but they left us by their examples and by their early laws, a tie that binds the encouragement of higher education to the vibrant American culture of freedom, of faith and freedom. And that generation envisioned the expansion of our vast republic, as Mr. Madison called it, the vast commercial republic from sea to shining sea but especially through the means of education and the unfolding democratic conversation and the expanding conversation, and of course through the tragic shedding of blood in the Civil War. The reality of freedom was no longer looking into the mirror darkly to borrow from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth. Even with post-Civil War fits and starts, freedom was becoming ever increasingly the norm in America. Mr. Lincoln's Gettysburg vision of a new birth of freedom was becoming a reality. And so how appropriate that Dr. King chose the steps of Mr. Lincoln's memorial to deliver his mighty speech about a dream. And the dream brought faith squarely into the conversation about basic human rights. Colleges and universities, as well as our churches, have played an integral role in America's story of faith and freedom. The institution where I'm privileged and blessed to serve, Baylor, is part of that large narrative. Founded by a judge, that's why, Bill, they call me judge. <laughs> Nobody else does, but it says, Judge Baylor was a judge, you're now judge. It's part of that narrative because this judge and former member of Congress from Alabama and a great patriot who saw the shedding of blood in the War of 1812. 
And he, along with two Baptist pastors, one from New England, educated at Brown University, where your beloved professor got his PhD, and one educated at Mercer in Georgia, the Westward Movement founding a Christian university. Baylor embodied in the then independent Republic of Texas the same spirit that was animating the worthies who founded Harvard two centuries before. Listen to these words from the founding generation of Harvard. After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and led the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and to perpetuate it to posterity. It pleased God to stir up the heart of one Mr. Harvard, a godly gentleman and a lover of learning, living among us to give one half of his estate toward the founding of the college. I recommend that to everyone here. <laughs> that is the story as well of Grove City College, the lifelong work of the Pew families and, and of the great Isaac Kettler. Those founders had a great dream to develop a Christian institution that would proclaim Christ and to this very day of Paul's inauguration, Grove City College stands as a very well-known nationally and internationally recognized beacon for America's first freedom. Freedom of religion and liberty of Congress. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Liberty of conscience, which unites us all today. And so, Paul, may that light continue to shine deeply into the 21st century. That's an important undertaking, especially now. As I close, let me note rather pessimistically that late in the 20th century, James Burchell wrote a troubling book. It's entitled, The Dying of the Light. The book chronicles in 870 pages. It's very long but he chronicles the disengagement of so many American colleges from their founding churches or simply as here, a beautiful Christian mission. That's what you're fighting. But in stark contrast, the light here continues to shine very brightly. And by God's grace and under Paul's inspired leadership of humility, the light will shine even brighter. Good morning. My name is Claire Vetter, and I am pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, former U.S. Attorney General, Governor, and U.S. Senator John Ashcroft. Raised in Springfield, Missouri, Mr. Ashcroft holds earned degrees from Yale University and the University of Chicago School of Law and has a long and distinguished career in public service as well as in the private sector. In 1973, he served as Missouri Auditor, followed by two terms as Missouri Attorney General. As Governor of Missouri from 1985 to 1993, Mr. Ashcroft served with exceptional management and fiscal integrity. He was named as one of the nation's top 10 education governors by Fortune magazine. In 1991, the nonpartisan National Governors Association voted him chairman. Elected to the U.S. Senate in 1994, Mr. Ashcroft helped to balance the federal budget for the first time in decades and served as a member of the Senate Judiciary, Foreign Relations, and Commerce Committees. In December 2000, Mr. Ashcroft was chosen for the position of U.S. Attorney General by President-elect George W. Bush. As Attorney General, Mr. Ashcroft integrated strategic planning, budgeting, and performance measures, resulting in a clean audit for the Department of Justice for the first time in its history. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, 
General Ashcroft led the Department of Justice through a transformational period and subsequently reorganized the department to focus on its number one priority, preventing terrorism. General Ashcroft is founder and chairman of the Ashcroft Group and the Ashcroft Law Firm, known together as The Firm. The firm has earned a reputation for integrity and a track record for accelerating successful resolutions of even the most complex matters. With a focus on issues of integrity and corporate governance, the firm provides compliance advice, legal counsel, and consulting services to world-leading clients, including Fortune 500 companies, multinational corporations, and corporate executives. He also spends time teaching at Regent University School of Law as a professor of law and government. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable John Ashcroft. She has a future in politics. <laughs> Did you notice that she didn't mention the fact that I'm the only person in the history of the universe to have lost an election forfeiting his Senate seat to a deceased opponent? Uh, <laughs> you want to get your ego adjusted. <laughs> it is an honor to be here, Paul. I'm looking where, there you are. <laughs> what a good deal. What a good deal for this institution. It is an, an anomaly to find a person of such great experience at such a tender age. And it must be attributable to his early years in education and to that guidance of Brenda who sits beside him. You are in for a wonderful experience of leadership. Leadership isn't taking polls. It's not finding out where people are already going and somehow using the poll to vault ahead of the people and then declaring when they arrive, I was here first, I'm the leader. No, leadership is the selection of noble objectives and the pursuit of those objectives with such intensity and, if you will, sacrifice that others are drawn into the operation. Sacrifice is the currency of leadership. You have a sacrificial leader of vision. And while I'm at it, just let me borrow the old proverb, where there's no vision, the people perish. It's also true, according to one of my preacher friends, that where there are no people, the vision perishes. <laughs> Great rivers gain strength points of confluence. Yeah, there's sometimes a little turbulence, but that's where momentum and mass builds so that something's achieved. The confluence of vision and people in this institution has great promise for the future, and I thank God for it, and I thank God for Paul, and I thank God for the honor of being here to share with you today. I am delighted to have this chance to speak to you. The single most important job of a culture is the transmission of values from one generation to the next. What are those values? What are the important ones? We are rehearsing those today. Faith is at the core, uh, core of it all. And our documents as a nation remind us of that. General Barr, so nice to see you here. We've got more attorneys general around here than, than you can imagine. There this be a good place for someone to slip and fall and need an attorney. I think. <laughs> we know that uh, our founding documents actually tell us that these are related concepts. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator. That's the faith part of it, with certain inalienable rights. Among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I like the centrality of liberty in that trilogy. At the heart of it all is liberty. And I think that's the core of American existence. It's the difference that America makes. 
we're an exceptional place because not that we're like everyone else, but we've been free to be like God calls us to be. And it's no accident when the French sent a monument to stand somewhere between New Jersey and New York. I'll not get involved in the argument right now. <laughs> that it's not called the statue of, statue of democracies. There are democracies around the world. It's called the Statue of Liberty. Liberty is a value. Democracy, while a valuable process, is a process. It stuns me that in some of our foreign policy, we seem to have confused the value of liberty with, with the process of democracy. So in the recent Arab Spring, for example, if we determined that some regime went into power as a result of a popular plebiscite or a democratic vote, we raced in to endorse them and then to sort of transfer a lot of Chinese wealth to them, the money that we borrowed that we then give away as foreign aid. You know? <laughs> and we endow them with some sense of dignity and recognition. Democracy is a process, and the process worked, but the outcome was not liberty. We had Christians and Jews being slaughtered, intimidated, if not exterminated, synagogues and houses of worship burning and being destroyed. The hallmark, yes, democracy is important. It's so important that it must be safeguarded and it must be regulated and it must be framed. Our constitution, in deference to the value of liberty, regulates the process of democracy. So we have a fragmented government so that there's no runaway train here. There's no capacity, even in the house, to do something before Wisdom might overtake some unwise action. It's slowed by the Senate, and then they have to act not only individually, they have to act in concert. And then in acting in concert, they submit what they have to the President of the United States, and it has to even be framed within the limits of the Constitution. At the time of that tragic assault on the United States, when we worked together, became the mantra of our department to say, we've got to think outside the box, but never outside the Constitution. There are frames in which we must operate. And the frame is designed to protect liberty. Liberty is the unique character of things that makes something ordinary, something very special. The poetry of Emma Lazarus, with, which graces the base of the Statue of Liberty, is uh, one of my favorite poems. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door, the lamp of liberty. I love the confidence that Emma had in liberty. Uh, she didn't say if you didn't go to Grove City College, you need not apply. She didn't say you've got to have the best SAT, scholastic aptitude test, she said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, the wretched refuse. There was only one qualification in her litany, and it said, yearning to breathe free. There was people coming here to be free people, not people coming here to be, get free stuff. I'm wondering if our immigration philosophy were if we were such a nation as to attract people who wanted to be free, not people who wanted free stuff, whether well, we might solve some of our immigration problem. But I hasten on. She, yes, let me not meddle in national politics. I'm not <laughs> she understood, reminded me of the uh, alchemists in the medieval times. They wanted to change base metal into gold, and they sought. They sought a way to develop a magic potion that you put it on lead and all of a sudden it would turn to gold. When they get that done, I want to buy, I want to be in on the ground floor. But you know, that's, that's not possible. We learned in the seventh grade, I think, studying the peri periodic table. Isn't that chart that goes on the wall of the science classroom that tells you how many protons there are in the nucleus of every atom that you can't swap fundamental elements like that? But there is an alchemy in human existence, and it is liberty. It changes base metal into gold. It changed the huddled masses and the wretched refuse 
into world beaters. It changes ordinary into extraordinary. It changes average into exceptional. And that's the promise of America for people who are inspired to reach the maximum of their God-given potential. Come here, a place where liberty prevails. I regret to say that freedom is under attack, but that's not really a novel statement. Freedom has always been under attack. And it, I guess I have to sort of reveal some of my faith bias here, but I think it's been under attack since the beginning. Uh, now, you've got to understand, I didn't go to seminary, reverends, and I, and I barely paid attention in Sunday school, so this could be wrong. <laughs> but as I recollect, our uh, Judeo-American and uh, Christian tradition is that there were two voices in the Garden of Eden. One voice says, just do it. You're free. It won't make a difference. The other voice says, be very careful what you do. You're free. You make a really big difference. The it won't make a difference statement is the idea that just do it. It's all over our advertising. It's become a cultural sort of thing, you know. Don't worry about the consequences. The problem is that when you don't make a difference, you're not described as being free, you're described as being meaningless. All of us want to have the capacity to make a difference. That's why you're here today. That's why you endow an institution like this so that people can leave here and make a difference, so they can have an impact, so the world will be changed so lives and families will be changed. So they will have the ability to, to aspire to great and noble things and the willingness to sacrifice to see them take place, become leaders. This idea that freedom in, requires concept, consequence and that the greatest gift of God following freedom is the gift of consequence for without it, freedom would be meaningless. We have that consequence. And we know that freedom only operates in the future. I sometimes go to schools and I'll say to the fifth grade class, how many of you can change the past? Not a single hand goes up. You don't have to be, a, what do they call it, a, a rocket surgeon or a brain scientist or something like that <laughs> to know that. I say, how many of you can change the future? We all can. And the great part of the faith is that it focuses on the, on the future, not on the past. Forgetting those things which were behind us, let us press to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous thing it is that freedom. And so it's to be fought for, it's to be safeguarded, it's to be understood, it's to be taught, it's to be written about. It's to be lived and practiced in our families. And it is to be safeguarded to the extent that we respect it for the minority of individuals because I'm afraid we are approaching a time in our culture when we may find ourselves as minorities desperately in need of the principle which we have sometimes ignored that freedom is really about the rights of people to do what they need to do without restraint in public, not in private. Some of the concerns over privacy in our culture are sort of signals that people want privacy because they want to be able to do things that they might not otherwise be able to do. Well, real freedom is what you can do in public. I don't want this to become a nation where freedom of religion means that you can worship in your house with the doors closed and the drapes drawn. I want freedom of religion to mean that we have the ability to say, think, and believe and testify as to what has happened in our lives. Uh, I've already gone past my time, but I want to end with something that illustrates part of this in our culture. I think if I were to say an advertising slogan halfway through, you could complete the slogan for me. I'll try it. This will not be on the final exam or the quiz, but I just thought I'd just say it. There is a, a saying that, and, and it's kind of a cherished saying. I, I'm surprised, I'm stunned by it. It goes like this, what happens in Las Vegas What a terrible lie. <laughs> At best, you could hope, the people are hoping that they could do things they should not do and somehow they would have no consequence. It is the equivalent of embracing the ethic of meaninglessness. 
We somehow are people who make choices, but the choices are no good. Not the choices described in Deuteronomy, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. No, but just choose to do anything you, you please and nothing will come of it. The problem is that if you are a person whose choices have no impact, you are of all people most miserable. And I'm here to say that this college is a marvelous celebrant of liberty. Let it be so forever. And I'm here to tell you happily that the slogan here might be what happens in Grove City doesn't stay in Grove City. That the beauty of what happens here is that it can have global impact. An impact that relates to faith, an impact that relates to freedom, an impact that will shape the future. God bless you and God bless this marvelous institution in the carrying out of the redemptive mission of healing, restoration, and forgiveness in his kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for those inspiring words about freedom and liberty, a principle we hold near and dear to our hearts here at Grove City College. And thank you, President Starr, or should I say Judge Starr, for your thought-provoking message about faith, our everlasting foundation here. Also appreciate the message about 50% of the estates being left to the college, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Honored guests and delegates, members of the faculty and administration, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Grove City College Board of Trustees, it is my great honor to welcome you to this momentous occasion that we celebrate today. As we prepare to inaugurate only the ninth president in our 139-year history, we are honored to have three former presidents here with us today. I am certain it is the first time in our history that we have had four presidents together in one row. I know that you will join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Sherry McKenzie and his wife Vonnie, Dr. John Moore and his wife Sue, and Dr. Richard Jewell and his wife Dale. Thank you to each of you for your prior service and to all of you for being here today for this joyous celebration. As part of the investiture ceremony, it is appropriate for those who represent the various constituencies within the Grove City College family to bring greetings and offer encouragement. Representatives from the faculty, student body, and alumni will now each offer salutations. My name is Dr. James Bibsa, and I teach in the Biblical and Religious Studies program. President McNulty, on behalf of the staff, faculty, and administration of Grove City College, I bring you our warmest greetings. You've obviously hit the ground running in your time here at, as president already, and it's our hope that in the future together we might be utilized by God to enhance this college, the students, and most of all, the kingdom of God. I believe you know the story of Esther. Esther was a Jewish woman who was chosen to be queen of Persia. No one knew that she was Jewish. Unfortunately, because of the mechanisms of an evil man named Haman, the Jews faced a death sentence. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, wanted Esther to go to the king under threat of death. And so he sent a message to Esther. He said, who knows, you may have come to this kingdom for just such a time as this. President McNulty, as our ninth president, in God's providence, you've been brought to this college to lead 
in it for just such a time as this. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Chesterton Cobb, and I'm the executive president of the Student Government Association. I first had the pleasure of meeting President McNulty while in my first semester at Grove City College, when he spoke at a banquet for student leaders. Well, at the time, I only knew that he was a trustee of the college and the father of one of my friends. His words greatly impacted my understanding of what it meant to be a leader. One of his main points was how essential humility is to leadership, that to lead is to serve a principle that he has lived out throughout his life in both word and deed. President McNulty, as a representative of the student body, it is my honor to express to you our salutations and warmest welcome to this great college and convey to you how grateful we are to have a leader that possesses such great ability with humility. As a student body, we are so grateful to be educated at an institution that holds a rich heritage of a commitment to both faith and freedom. And we greatly appreciate that you embody, embody and um, affirm those values, and we are confident that you will lead us humbly into the future with excellence. Welcome to Grove City College. My name is Gerald Bullock, and I'm honored to serve as president of the Alumni Association. President McNulty, on behalf of the Alumni Council and 26,833 living alumni throughout the United States and 41 countries around the world, we welcome you as Grove City College's ninth president and fourth as an alumnus. We as the Alumni Association congratulate you and pledge our support to you on this great day of celebration. This beloved institution, its students, Faculty, staff, trustees, friends, and its graduates are so blessed to have you as our leader. Our partnership together will undoubtedly bring remarkable opportunities in the years to come. Whether we are here on campus or greeting you at alumni events throughout the country, we look forward to knowing you and Mrs. McNulty and embracing your vision for the next chapter in Grove City's history. As alumni, we ask of you to continue to engage and nurture our efforts as ambassadors for the college, thus strengthening the ties to our alma mater. We stand with you today, committed to uphold the faith, freedom, and the future of Grove City College. Our prayers are with you on this inauguration day, and we ask God to continue to richly bless you, your family, your presidency, as the next leader of this extraordinary place. Mid the pines and columns growing. With us today are some extraordinary women and men who have contributed talent and time and treasure to make Grove City College such a very special place. They are members of our Board of Trustees. And it's most appropriate that they participate in a significant way in this installation ceremony. So therefore, I'm going to ask them to take their places now uh, in the chancel as we proceed uh, with uh, the activities. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Grove City College family, I am pleased to introduce to you for investiture the Honorable Paul J. McNulty. The Grove City College Board of Trustees does not take lightly 
the responsibilities to enhance and support the founding principles that were adopted when this great institution started 139 years ago. As Judge Starr so accurately portrayed, many other schools have abandoned that perspective, yet we remain true to who we are and what we believe. As part of that commitment as trustees, we recognize that perhaps the most important decision that we may make is the selection of the leader of the institution. This selection was one that took a great deal of time. There was a search committee that included board members. It included members of the faculty, members of the administration folks from close by and folks from far away. We considered more than 75 candidates, many sitting presidents of institutions. But that committee came to the conclusion unanimously and recommended to the Board of Trustees who concurred unanimously that the Honorable Paul J. McNulty from the class of 1980 should be the ninth president of Grove City College. As a sign of that investiture, I give you this medallion, which conveys the privileges and rights and responsibilities of the office of president of Grove City College. I'd ask that you all join me now as my friend from the great class of 1954, the former dean of the chapel, a longtime trustee and now trustee emeritus, Dr. Richard A. Morledge, leads us in the investiture prayer. Trustees, gather around. It's a great day in the kingdom, and it's ordained by God, and we're very grateful that we can be here. Paul and your wife, this is no strange place. Harbison Chapel is a very sacred and special place. You know that the first day that you were on this campus as a freshman, you worshiped in Harbison Chapel the last night before graduation, you were here for baccalaureate. You are standing right now where you stood 34 years ago when President McKenzie and Dr. Hoffecker united you in holy marriage. And I understand we have a grandchild now. <laughs> Better come to Grove City College, that's all I say. <laughs> This is a very special day and a special place. And the Board of Trustees, who unanimously, unanimously, on the recommendation of the Great Search Committee, elected you the ninth president of this great historic institution. Trustees, I ask now, please, if you extend your right hands for the laying on of hands as we commit to this man and invest him as the president of Grove City College. Father, we come before you. You are our God, our hope for years to come. And, O oh Lord, you created Paul through his parents who are on the other side together with their son, watching from on high, surrounding and being a part of the cloud of many witnesses. You created Paul, you brought him to this particular moment in history. We thank you for the family, especially this new one, 
and the other one who is looking on from above. Father, bless all of those and thank you for the faculty, the friends, the fraternity brothers, all the people who have helped to fashion this man and bring him to this historic moment. We commit him unto you. Father, bless his mind, his heart, and his spirit. And help him as he leads all of us in the future through the paths of freedom and faith. And please, Father, help all of us to be people who are obedient to you. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Lord and the Savior of Paul and many of us here today. Please, Father, please bless this man and his family as he assumes this high responsibility. Hallelujah. It's a great day in the kingdom and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Lux mea. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
it was in a class that Brenda and I attended together uh, that we got to know each other much better. It was a Jim Bibza taught class back in the 70s. Jim Bibza and uh, Gerald and, and Chesterton, thank you for your kind words. And to Keith and Kristen and all of our extraordinarily talented students, thank you for sharing your gifts with us. By the way, moms and dads of, out there of, uh, with children who are complaining about their music lessons, <laughs> don't give up. <laughs> Let me tell you that an institution of this nature is so blessed by the talents of our students. And we are enriched by it. And uh, for every small child out there practicing the violin right now or, or the guitar, I look forward to the, the sharing of those gifts someday with us. Dr. Morledge. We are all thankful that you're here today, and thank you for your, your prayer. And as David has pointed out, Presidents McKenzie and Moore and Jewell, that's roughly 40% of all the previous Grove City Presidents. Um, thank you so much for your extraordinary leadership and stewardship of, of this school. To all my family and friends, your generosity and kindness is a magnificent blessing. We'll really try to not have another big McNulty event for a while so you can replenish your savings. <laughs> One of the reasons why I'm standing up here and not in the pulpit, as uh, Dr. Morley's just mentioned, I'm standing at the top of these steps um, because this is one of my favorite spots in the world. Other than the saving grace of God, the best thing that ever happened in my life occurred right here 34 years ago. When Brenda Milliken looked at me and agreed at Dr. McKenzie's lead to take me for better or worse. <laughs> And she learned what that worst part meant. <laughs> but she's been true to her vow to be my beloved wife for all these years. I love you, Brenda. You're an awesome first lady. <laughs> well, this uh, of course, is quite an event, and um, many of us have been enjoying a rediscovery essay written by Sir William Ramsey in 1915, a renowned archaeologist and biblical scholar, an essay on the educational work of one Isaac Kettler, the founder of Grove City College. Here's what Dr. Ramsey had to say about academic ceremonies. The want of ceremonial is a marked feature of American university life. And only in a few places does anyone care enough for it to attempt to create some academic custom. Dr. Kettler had a certain idea of university ceremony and a wish to encourage it. And he, he did not carry his idea and wish far, but he had at heart, as I thought, the vague hope of creating some of the outward pomp of university life. Created ceremony, however, falls easily into the air of being hollow and unconvincing. So writes Sir Ramsey. Now, Dr. Kettler was strongly opposed to academic elitism. His mission, for which he was passionate, was to build a democratic community of education within which the rich and the poor, side by side, would become highly educated in the treasures of wisdom and knowledge for the good of the country. That's why he was so committed to providing an affordable education and why we hold that firmly as a core conviction to this day. And that's the point. Dr. Kettler would be very pleased 
with how Grove City College today blends its Christian identity with academic excellence and affordability, just as he hoped and prayed. We're one of the best values in higher education, and President Kettler would undoubtedly support appropriate ceremony on special occasions. We all understand the important role these ceremonies play in any institution, including the life of a nation. But if they are not emblems of unseen reality, they are hollow and unconvincing. By God's amazing grace, powerfully at work in the lives of countless men and women for nearly 140 years, we gather this morning to celebrate the reality of his overwhelming blessing and to rededicate ourselves to Dr. Kettler's vital mission. So let me offer a brief word about the future. Whenever we talk about the future, we must exercise a certain care. The scriptures warn us to not presume upon God's providence. In James' epistle, we read, we do not know what tomorrow will bring. Instead, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The Proverbs give us wisdom in this. Many are the plans of the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And even if we didn't have the light of God's word on this subject, wisdom would tell us to be careful when it comes to our thoughts about the future. We live in uncertain times filled with risk. And this is especially true in the world of higher education, particularly Christian higher education. Grove City College has been greatly blessed, and we are in a strong position to meet the challenges of the future. But we don't know all the challenges that we face. So how then should we speak of the future? We want this celebration to give us a better sense of direction, a greater preparation for what lies ahead. But how do we avoid presumption and, and deal with the uncertainties that undoubtedly await us. Well, there are at least two ways the Bible teaches us to think about the future. First, we can speak of our moral duty. We have God's commands and the testimony of our consciences to guide us into tomorrow. Thy word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 19. Micah tells us, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And we have the model of Christ when it comes to humility. Mark read from Philippians chapter 2. Christ didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He became nothing for us. He took on the, the form of a servant so that we might live. That's the model that we have. That's how we can walk. You only need to look at the program in your hand to be reminded of this. Our great college seal on it, the words, Lux Mare, my light, over the open Bible. And like many other schools, as President Starr reminded us this morning, unlike many other schools, made a similar profession at one time, we haven't abandoned our religious convictions. We have a vivid reminder of this. We have an image of faithfulness to our moral duty right here in this beautiful chapel. 
the Harbison Chapel, the sons of Samuel Harbison, William and Ralph, provided the funding to build this chapel in 1930 and 1931. According to a master plan that was to build a campus on the upper level from the original lower level campus, the chapel was to be the centerpiece around which everything was built. The depression hit. Joblessness was on the rise and the Harbisons had made a pledge to build a chapel of extraordinary quality. And they were told they didn't have to follow through with their commitment under the circumstances. But because they wanted to honor their father, who was a godly man and who had a great passion as a trustee of the college for its mission as a Christian school, they sacrificed, deeply sacrificed, in order to have the chapel built. They also thought of providing work to those who needed jobs brought them up from Pittsburgh so they could have employment. That's the story of this building. It's a, it's a, a symbol of faithfulness, of, of adherence to a moral duty. And the great teaching window, don't everybody look back right now, but the great <laughs> teaching window above Christ and all the subjects, to, of all the disciplines surround Christ, uh, the great teaching window has Christ in the center and a lamp above his head. This is just one of the many stories from our great past that should strengthen us for the future. Remember God's great faithfulness to us over the years. This encourages us to walk in the light of his truth along the path of faith and freedom. And that leads us to the second way we should view the future through the lens of the scriptures. We know that nothing happens apart from God's will. He sits on his throne and does all things well. And every time we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we acknowledge that our Heavenly Father is bringing His perfect will to pass in this world just as He does in heaven. This means that we can be at peace about the future. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 4, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving because there is confidence that God hears and does all things well. And the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. While we don't know if our plans are God's plans or if our wants are His wants, we do know with certainty that God's plans will prevail and they will be good. So the future of Grove City College is in very good hands. Not my hands, his hands. We wouldn't want it any other way. Look how far he has brought us and how richly he has blessed us in nearly 140 years. We're all excited to see the wonderful things he has in store for us even if our blessings include difficulties and struggles. Because that's the way he often blesses us most effectively. My friends, we all must come to this place in our hearts where we can say in the words of Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. Brenda and I saw this transformation of submission to God's will in the heart of our son Joe as cancer was spreading through his body. 
He told us that he didn't pray so much that he would get better, but that God would be glorified in his suffering. He came to want what God wanted for the future, not what he wanted. And in the last days of November of 2012, laying in a hospital bed in Columbia, South Carolina, about a week before he left this world to be with the Lord, he was thinking about Grove City College. He apparently had been encouraged by a song, Speak, O Lord, written by Keith Getty and Stuart Cummings. And he sent to his sister, Corey, who was a junior here at the time, an email. The only words, other than the attached song, it's the title of the email. And it said, you should spread this song around GCC. He obviously had a high view of the college, though he chose to go to James Madison rather than the alma mater of his mother and his father. <laughs> he thought this prayer would catch on with Grove City College, with the college family. And I am eternally thankful that by God's grace, this is what he wanted for himself and for us. You have those words before you in the bulletin and in a bookmark. Please look closely at them. Reflect on them. Verse 1. That the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. The truth would prevail over unbelief. That our minds would be renewed. That we would grasp the height of God's plan for us. And that by faith, we may walk as he walks with us. May God grant us the grace to embrace this calling both as individuals and as an institution of higher learning. Thank you. 
dreams Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us Truths unchanged from the dawn of time That will echo down through eternity And my grace will stand on your promises And my faith will walk as you walk with us Speak As we sing this final verse together, speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the hearts of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dark. May the light of Christ be seen in us today and in all the days to come. President and Mrs. McNulty, members of the Grove City College family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both on this very happy day and then forevermore. Amen. Now please remain standing and let's join together and sing the alma mater. We'd like to ask all of our guests to please be seated. Trustees, administrators, 
honored delegates, members of the faculty, please remain standing. Dr. Inman.